Now uh, we are moving to the last panel today and um, uh, I'm very happy to present um, first participants here. I will moderate this panel and uh, later uh, the, uh, in the discussion uh, they will um, explain a little bit about uh, the blockchain ecosystems uh, which uh, they are covering in their countries. Uh, this panel is intended to uh, present first the concept of blockchain weeks that were provided in different countries. So for Luxembourg, um, Tom Kettles, uh, he um, uh, within uh, Infrachain co-organized uh, Luxembourg Blockchain Week. Uh, then Fiona, uh, she uh, is from uh, Ireland, uh, she organized um, Ireland Blockchain Week. Uh, then we have, um, I have to check, but uh, I think that we have Perin here. Um, she uh, as well provided um, the uh, series of uh, blockchain uh, events. Uh, Laura from uh, Italy, and the same, and uh, Victoria, I hope uh, she is with us. She is from a blockchain convention. Um, and, and, um, the last but not least, Tadej Slapnik, uh, he um, is very much active in the region of, uh, uh, in the Adriatic region uh, and uh, he's uh, um, chairing Blockchain Adria uh, organization, so I hope um, uh, that uh, we will all uh, enlighten a discussion about how the ecosystem can contribute uh, to strengthening the, um, uh, the blockchain movement or blockchain um, technology integration uh, into uh, the companies, into research area and also into the civil society. Um, so first uh, I would like um, Fiona, you, uh, <laughs> to make sure presentation uh, and then we uh, move to uh, Laura, that should be um, the next one. I will sit there. <laughs> Thanks very much, Nina. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, it's a really lovely city. It's lovely to be traveling again. And uh, it's great to be with uh, members of this pretty huge global community because I think Nina was telling me earlier on that there's like a thousand people joining us today and over the next few days. So. Um, I'm delighted to be here to represent an organization called Blockchain Ireland. We are based in the Republic of Ireland. We are the signatory organization from Ireland for the European Blockchain Partnership. That We signed that in uh, 2018, I think it was. And since then, um, uh, we have become, I would say, like a community of practice. Uh, within Ireland. It's a real interface between uh, industry, early movers, a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of um, oh, hustle, hustle, hustle people who maybe aren't technologists but are really interested in the possibilities of new types of financial services, new routes to the market, massive curiosity about NFTs, all that kind of stuff. Um, so we, we find ourselves at this um, moment where we are concerned with not quite education but onboarding I would say to the to the citizen population or to the interested in the business community as well as being a place where collaborations and um, projects can become initiated there's a number of different businesses that are established uh, particularly with feet in more than one trading territory some very strong connections with Hong Kong um, Singapore, obviously the UK, um, but a lot of, uh, I would say, financial services moving more towards decentralized financial services. That seems to be quite a good fit f for Ireland. It's a kind of a miniature home of finance. So uh, it's been very interesting to see the role of the, the central bank, how that's changing, uh, what they're looking to support and what companies and what services are emerging there. Uh, side by side with that pretty advanced 
um, DeFi innovation, I would say we have a slower level, probably led by research, um, in, in, in that interface between the public and private sector, particularly something like supply chain, food, agriculture, um, all managing all of that kind of stuff. And Blockchain Ireland has become a place where decision makers or leaders in those fields can come together and I guess learn from each other what is the language of digital transformation that is effective <laughs> in bringing new projects forward. Uh, and it affords an opportunity, and this was the great thing about Blockchain Ireland Week, to come back to your question. It was this amazing opportunity for the community to self-represent, to host, co-host, and participate in just a ton of different uh, events, host them themselves, participate, uh, the, the, the whole week was funded by Algorand and Accenture. Uh, we had a lot of support from local, uh, local authorities and uh, some government departments. And then all of the big and small companies could strike a pose and host an event, most of the events. In fact, all of them, I think, were virtual. And then, you know, a couple of people went to a restaurant kind of thing. <laughs> but uh, the, all, the whole week was uh, an absolute moment of acceleration for Blockchain Ireland. The fact that it was virtual made it more accessible to the national uh, community, the national ecosystem. And uh, we garnered something like 2,000 new participants or new members for the organization. Uh, and so accelerating that and satisfying their needs is the, is the current goal. <laughs> and, uh, um, and we're working together in a collaborative way now to bring forward a new national strategy to support blockchain services and ecosystems uh, in Ireland. Um, so we're at a very exciting time. And uh, yeah, it's really great to be able to talk about it here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we will later uh, go through what were the main findings uh, of uh, your blockchain weeks. Um, but here, if you allow me, <laughs> Tom, um, I would like to ask Laura, if uh, she's with us, uh, to present the uh, Italian um, happening and movement. And uh, also, uh, I was participating two years ago in Rome uh, when you were establishing uh, um, the whole movement of blockchain. So please, Laura, um, uh, and uh, uh, go ahead, present this, uh, and uh, we will talk later about how, um, what the approach you will have for the future. Uh, so please, thank you. Thank you. Can you hear us? Yeah. Okay. Good evening, Dagna. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for this important opportunity. Uh, I'm Laura Cappello. I'm founder of Cappello Italian Law Firm. Uh, I'm also a member of INATBA, INATBA and uh, I'm president of the Legal and Governance Board of Quadrants Foundation. Uh, with me is uh, Raffaello Maria Del Re, software engineer, uh, part of my legal engineering team. Uh, here is my Italian case study. Uh, okay, just a moment. Can you see slide? You need to. Can you see Nena? Yeah. Okay. 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 Um, Can you go full screen? Full screen. No. Okay. no? So no. Okay. okay. Uh, in the last years, Italy has uh, accelerated the digital transformation of businesses and public services. Uh, following the pandemic and with the, the national recovery and resilient plan, Italy has placed green and digital transition and new technologies at the basis of the economic restart. The PNRR is part of the next generation EU program whose main component is the recovery and resilience facility. The plan is developed around six missions, digitalization, innovation, competitiveness and culture, 
green revolution and ecological transition, infrastructures for sustainable mobility, education and research, inclusion and cohesion health. Among the national initiatives, in line with the, the objectives of the PNRR and the European strategies, uh, there is the one launched in May 2021 by Ischia. Ischia is one of the six uh, municipalities that make up the island of Ischia in the province of Naples and uh, uh, is one of the most popular Italian tourist destinations for the extraordinary beauty of the landscapes and for the local cuisine. Ischia uh, has decided to anticipate shaping Europe's digital future, uh, assigned to a pool of experts, uh, of which I am a member and the coordinator, uh, the task of identifying uh, solutions uh, in a digital key aimed at relaunching and optimizing the local economy and therefore the tourism, uh, which is a leading sector of the Italian and the European economy. Uh, in particular, uh, in an important resolution of March, the 25th of 2021, uh, EU specified that uh, the tourism sector has an impact on the EU economy, uh, on environmental sustainability, uh, on the objectives of the European Green Deal, and therefore on general social well-being and economic security. Uh, the result of the team's work is a legal, strategic, and technological feasibility study uh, intended to lay the foundations for the subsequent and wider planning of an island ecosystem digital and interoperable. Uh, the ISCA project, through the implementation of new technologies, uh, in particular blockchain, AI, IoT machine learning, aims to create an ecosystem in which public services, um, essential services, and all the productive artistic and cultural fabric uh, will be interconnected uh, within a network in which every single party draws support from the mutual interactions created by the network itself. Uh, the Quadrants blockchain platform uh, represents the technology indicated to implement the project. Uh, the ecosystem that uh, Ischia wants to create uh, involves the digitalization of the entire territory, uh, starting with the public administration uh, through the simplification of bureaucracy, uh, to support the creation of an administration close to the community and companies. Uh, this digitalization will have a positive impact on essential sectors of the Ischia area, uh, such as uh, health, tourism, uh, production, transport, culture, art, uh, ultimately affecting general well-being. Within the ecosystem, uh, sustainability will play an important role, uh, aiming at the creation on an, an, entire, an entirely uh, self-sufficient and sustainable territory, uh, powered by renewable sources uh, with the reduced environmental impact. Uh, the goal is to create a virtual system uh, in which uh, ver verifiable and trusted tracking of consumption uh, will stimulate energy users organized in self-sufficient energy communities uh, on the importance of responsible procurement aimed at reducing waste. Uh, the outcome of this uh, digitalized uh, ecosystem uh, also requires uh, legal support 
that allows not only to attribute the legal compliance to the project itself, but uh, to guide ISKIA in the necessary digital transition process. Uh, for this reason, I'm coordinating this project uh, in order to apply the consultancy model uh, that I called legal engineering. Uh, it consists specifically in legal compliance and software engineering. Digitalization uh, will become the key to the enhancement of the territory and will allow the, uh, the island uh, to become the first ecosystem in the world that is entirely digitalized, anthropocentric, sustainable, transparent, inclusive, and focus on the well-being of the community. Uh, Raffaello Maria del Re, software engineer, uh, will briefly illustrate the technology aspect. Thank you, Lara. Just a couple of minutes. So this is actually what we're doing. Uh, and thank you, Nena. Thank you all. Uh, this is what we're doing in Ischia. Um, I was listening to the panels before, and I was thinking that maybe we should talk more about uh, the problems that we have by divulging what we're doing, actually. Because for us that we're part of the community, and Nena knows this, it is easy to understand where we're going. But when we start talking about digital finance, and I heard a couple of uh, um, speeches before that were addressing this, I always say that we need to explain very carefully and very um, exactly what we're doing when we're talking about pure digital finance. Um, and pure digital finance, what, what is difficult to explain to people that do not know anything about blockchain or what we're actually doing, I always say that it's machines that are working for us, software that is working for us while we sleep or while, while we do nothing that has to do with our income. And when we do not need intervention or intermediates by humans, you know, we can call that pure digital and thus finance if we use blockchain technology. And this has been very hard to, to uh, explain even to people that are technologists. You know, I'm a software engineer, but I do this. This is, you know, uh, a five-year program. And even for me at the beginning, understanding pure digital finance was difficult. But when we start to explain, it's very important that all the ones that are not part of our community understand that we are, we have created a system that is open software that is based on trust on the software, not on the people. We're, we're, we have to make companies and uh, public understand that we can, we, we do not have to worry about transactions. We can make a new economic basis, which is obvious for us that we, we talk about this, but to make them understand that the new paradigm is about basing economy on peer-to-peer -peer, and we're going to make the outcome for the well-being of mankind, of the not only our community. So software engineers, from my point of view, have always had a hard time expressing what we were doing because it always looks like a garage thing, something that we're making for ourselves, right? Uh, we always have to prove that it's not a scam, but time is on our side. We need to explain and divulge with clarity and user cases as we're doing in this meet. So what we've done with Ischia, it, it's a small community, but we've also had to explain very carefully what we were doing. And companies, I think, uh, need to take a leap and embrace token technology experimenting with pure digital ventures. And this is what we're working uh, at. And this is the hardest part. The technology part is already done. It, it's already working and we know that it works. And now we have to prove to everyone else that true digital finance is the outcome. Thank you.
Also, um, very interesting because uh, on one hand, I uh, had a feeling that you are going to build the community um, in parallel, but uh, this case is uh, very interesting because you concentrate it into Asia and then uh, here make smart uh, city and uh, smart uh, um, community. So uh, your use case is uh, very interesting and I'm sure that we will continue the uh, discussion after the presentations also to tell us what are the lessons learned from uh, the process that you uh, passed now in uh, two years. Uh, thank you very much for now. Uh, Tom, please. If you can just summarize what are uh, findings from that uh, your uh, Luxembourg or Infrachain Blockchain Week. Yes, sure, indeed. So thank you, Nina. Thank you, Tadej, and also thank you to the Slovenian uh, presidency for inviting me to this uh, very important event. Um, so briefly, a word about um, Infrachain. So we're a non-profit organization uh, based in, in Luxembourg with um, international membership. Um, so we focus on operational uh, blockchain um, projects, uh, so really on operational uh, use cases. Uh, we are also an active supporter actually of the European uh, blockchain initiatives. For instance, we are uh, hosting uh, two of the EBSI nodes, um, well, hosting one and managing one for uh, the Ministry of Digitalization uh, in Luxembourg and also engaged in a few a project uh, that is uh, co-funded by the European Union. Um, apart from that, so also we are very happy to actually be engaged on a more international level for OECD, for instance, and a proud member of uh, INATPA. Um, maybe a few words about the ecosystem first. So Luxembourg um, has quite a diverse ecosystem. A lot of it um, is quite naturally, I would say, uh, focused on finance. Finance being one of the strong sectors uh, in Luxembourg, of course. So there are quite some um, companies that are active in the fields of um, digital uh, financial services. So DeFi in uh, decentralized marketplaces, in wallets, in uh, financial inclusion, and so on and so on. And uh, that's really, I would say, one of the uh, predominant uh, aspects. Um, we also see that it's very interesting, actually, that uh, there was a study last year by the European Blockchain Observatory and Forum. So um, that's uh, Luxembourg is ranked number three with regard to the number of blockchain startups uh, with, uh, in relation to the population. Uh, so it has really some, some traction uh, in our country. Now, the uh, initiative that we launched earlier this year, the Luxembourg Blockchain Week, um, is actually an initiative that was launched by the Luxembourg Blockchain Lab. The Luxembourg Blockchain Lab is uh, already an initiative um, by the, well, it's an initiative by the ecosystem, uh, because the Luxembourg Lab is not only infrachain, our community, but um, we actually, uh, we partnered with uh, a few other uh, important blockchain players in Luxembourg, I would even say among the most important blockchains in Luxembourg. So on the one hand, we have actually um, Academia, so we are partnering here with the University of Luxembourg and also with the Luxembourg Institute of Science and Technology. And on the other hand, we have uh, two other communities. So we have the Loft, which is the Luxembourg House of Financial Technologies. And we have Let's Block, which is um, also a blockchain association in Luxembourg. So together, the five partners, uh, we created the, the Luxembourg Blockchain um, Lab, and the idea was already also really to, um, well, to, to bring the whole ecosystem together, um, because uh, even if, uh, of course, everybody knows each other and works sometimes together, but it's different than actually having a, a formal partnership. And one of the first things so that we organized was this Luxembourg uh, Blockchain a week, and I think one of the conclusions was really that there was a huge interest uh, generally in, in blockchain. We were quite happy that even from the first edition we had more than 1,000 uh, attendees and uh, also participants from, from around um, the world. And actually also here we tried to further expand the ecosystem, so we had a very um, fruitful um, collaboration with the Boston Blockchain Association, so even looking beyond European uh, Union, 
Um, so looking into the US to also share experience uh, with, with them and also to collaborate uh, on, on that side. Um, I think generally, yes, so you asked for, for conclusions about that uh, week. Um, I think one can say that there are, it's still actually quite, um, when we look at um, sectors beyond finance, it's still quite um, um, a young sector, a young, block, um, young technology. Um, there are very few large-scale use cases around. There are a lot of um, smaller pox by, um, driven mostly by, um, by individual companies, so that's something one, one can clearly see. Um, and this is something also where we are actively working on so that uh, to see that uh, blockchain projects get, get more, um, uh, gather more cloud so that they get actually more, more importance. But in general, one sees that, for instance, in the uh, sector of supply chain that was already mentioned earlier, so we have a lot of uh, tracing um, use cases uh, by different players that are doing uh, similar things but that are not necessarily collaborating. Um, for different reasons, I guess, uh, you don't find a lot of communi uh, communication about what these reasons are. I would say that maybe interoperability is one of these reasons. Uh, but, well, I have not seen any formal explanation on that. So that's definitely something I think that, that we have seen. Um, um, apart from that, definitely, yes, uh, DeFi uh, and FinTech um, is definitely a strong driver of uh, blockchain in general. And then very closely, as it was mentioned before, supply chain, uh, logistics, uh, anything that is related to tracing origins. Um, and then we see a strong interest uh, that is also now in uh, tokenization, NFTs, of course, uh, and also in uh, self-sovereign identities, role of uh, self-sovereign identities, which I think was already also a topic uh, earlier this, this afternoon. Um, what we uh, can also see is a strong role of, of government. Um, also in, in Luxembourg we see that so InfraChain itself is actually a PPP um, because the government is actively involved in our association along with the private sector. And uh, there is indeed strong interest also for the cooperation. And one can see that a lot of uh, companies are looking onto government also to push the sector actually to drive it and uh, to be um, as often with technology, um, so by imposing a certain technology uh, at some point, uh, by, by driving the, the sector, and um, so that's um, something that we, we see, see very, very clearly. Um, yes, I think, and what, what um, another conclusion is, I mentioned it is interoperability standards, that's something that is really um, missing, so that the different um, use cases can work together, different um, blockchains can work together so that you have, you have also some certainty that uh, yeah, what you do today um, in one place on one blockchain, well, it will be able to use that uh, information uh, tomorrow in a different context, in different uh, blockchain, for instance. And I think I will stop for that because I'm sure you have some more questions. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think everything is relevant, what you said. Uh, from um, two, three big use cases to public-private partnerships to interoperability standards, but we can uh, take into consideration all them separately and then connect them into some um, integrated uh, issue that we can develop in further steps. Maybe here uh, also the, um, if we have Parisa with us uh, for the Chase program, we know that, um, uh, please Damian, uh, can you check if Parisa is with us? Yes, yes. yes. Perfect. Um, I'm very glad to have you here because uh, you are um, um, presenting Chase program today. Uh, this was an idea not to have only uh, ecosystems but to show how the knowledge is very important to be shared in all the segments of um, uh, the ecosystem. So if you can just briefly present the project and then uh, we will have a discussion about this. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. You. Uh, I don't know if you see my uh, slides. Do you see that? Yes. Yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, so thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I would uh, like to present you um, the Chase project. That's a blueprint for sectoral cooperation on blockchain skill development. I introduce myself. My name is Paisa Godouz. I'm full professor at University of Lyon 1. And uh, I'm a leader of a research team on the blockchain. And particularly, I work on the interoperability. Uh, research um, parts. So uh, I will uh, explain you rapidly uh, what are the objectives and why we have this project, the Chase project. We know that blockchain is the core of the European strategy to advance digital transformation, but uh, the problem is that the sector is challenged by talent shortage and the global competitive pressure and limited also connections between education and the market. So uh, this project Chase, that's a four years project that is started by November 22. Uh, the objective is to develop the strategy of European blockchain skills. There is also another objective is that how we can forecasting the future skills. What's the mechanism for forecasting the future skills and how we can define that. And uh, of course, uh, we have done actually an analysis of different occupational requirements at the European uh, part. And uh, we develop also a VET program uh, in the MOOC form. Uh, and uh, of course, at the end, the mobility schemes. Um, and the last and not the least is the European cooperative network. It's very important for us to have the sustainable European cooperative network, as you said before. And uh, we will have also the national blockchain skills partnerships and European uh, blockchain skills partnership. So this is a big project with 28 partners, uh, 23 partners, five associations from uh, 15 countries with uh, different sector representatives, uh, such as Inatba, that, that's famous in Europe, different companies, big companies, uh, such, as, such as Fujitsu, IOTA, or C4A, and also educational training providers, uh, such as University of Ljubljana, and also University of Tartu in Stony, uh, University of Catalonia in um, Spain, and the HPW in Germany, and of course, University of Lyon in France. We have also different entities with uh, regulator functions, uh, such as ECQA that uh, you know very well, and also the other associations. So the three main objectives is uh, the collaboration. That's uh, very important to set up a collaborative method for monitoring the workplaces and skill needs. And uh, of course, have this sustainable cooperation network, provide a mechanism for collaboration at national level and survey and plug, uh, promote blockchain VET offerings to practitioners. What's interesting uh, with uh, this uh, VET offering is that we will not just give the specialized, I said, uh, courses on the computer science, but we want to have also the skill, uh, I, I said, offerings and also the covered disciplinary. So it's really important and originality of this project also is that we will not have just the technical competencies, but also non-technical and soft competencies. The, there's also the second objective, the skill intelligence and training with the development of a MOOC uh, with the deliverables that actually is online on our website is blockchain skill intelligence and document skills mismatch, the different educational resources that we will provide and uh, also a sectoral qualification that we need actually in the Europe that we want to establish that. And uh, at the end, the recognition and mobility in order to have a EU-wide occupational requirements for blockchain work, uh, workforce. And there is a platform also in order to have a correspondence between the job seekers and blockchain companies. And uh, of course, linking to the design, uh, the design curriculum with the uh, European recognition tools. Uh, I will not talk a lot, but you can go to, to our website. Uh, that's a Chase Blockchain Skill EU and be a part of this uh, project. It is really important for us to have all of the uh, European uh, I said countries to be involved and uh, also give their opinion about the different deliverables. All of this is open uh, and public, so you can access to all of our deliverables and please be part of the cooperative networks that we want to create.
Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope at, uh, at the end we will highlight how uh, Chase program uh, can also contribute to the stronger development of uh, ecosystems and what will be in the next stage, for example, to include more of the ecosystems uh, in Europe into uh, that um, uh, knowledge scheme uh, so uh, that they can get some more um, uh, knowledge trainings and uh, dedicated uh, lessons. But in any case, I wanted to ask you something. Uh, you were mentioning sectoral uh, trainings. Um, we know that technology is more or less uh, horizontal and sectoral trainings are vertical. So which um, focused sectoral trainings were you uh, planning uh, for the next period? Uh, for this reason that uh, I said that uh, our objective is not just only the generic on horizontally, uh, I said courses or vet education, but the capability for the, um, I said, learners to uh, use the use cases for the different applications and be capable to understand the client's, you know, I said, uh, requirements and then uh, also uh, use the, uh, all of the competencies that they have obtained from the MOOC in order to apply to different applications. Actually, we know that uh, we, are, we don't want to focus to one of the applications, for example, bank finance, that's a very famous actually for the blockchain, but uh, 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 an num important number of the applications that we, we have obtained from analysis, such as health science, actually we know with COVID that is very important to have have the applications on the health, for example, and uh, even the other applications. So we, we have analyzed this one and we will have four or five domains that uh, we think that today is important to have the use cases on that. Okay, thank you very much. Maybe you. Uh, the, <laughs> um, Perin, uh, if you are here, if you can just continue, what uh, were you um, doing in France uh, this um, in this COVID period and uh, in this um, set of uh, <clears throat> events, uh, I have to say that we didn't manage to organize the one uh, for presenting uh, Slovenian blockchain partnership, but we will have a lot of uh, space in October to do this. So um, now first, please uh, do just briefly uh, what you achieved through this uh, uh, events and uh, what would be the maybe the main um, uh, points that you would uh, um, emphasize here within this um, uh, panel. Yes, uh, good afternoon Nina, it's a pleasure to be with you. Even online I would prefer to be with you in Ljubljana. Um, so it has been a really a very interesting period we have all lived with its uh, dramatic uh, consequences, but also an acceleration in the way we, we share our good practices. And it's true that I had began already in, 20, in, in, uh, in, 19, in 2019 with a conference called Blockchain Open Education and Digital Citizenship that took place exactly in this learning center of my University of Lille. And I was already part of the use case diploma within the European Blockchain Partnership. Uh, then it happened, the, the lockdown came and uh, I was appointed as the French contact point within EBSI for any stakeholder, French stakeholder. So in June, 2020, I decided with my vice president for digitization, Pierre Boulet, to, uh, to propose uh, that all this fantastic expertise that came to me was uh, brought to all the people we, who, who had uh, come. So I have uh, today a mailing list of uh, 2,000, uh, two, no, sorry, 260 uh, different people. And uh, when I organize a webinar, they come. So in 2020, it was about the four first use case of, uh, of the European Blockchain Partnership, with, which, is, which are self-sovereign identity. Um, you had the, the data, data sharing. And I, I say hello to the, the, 
the friends now <laughs> almost from Worldline. Uh, and of course, there is a fantastic ecosystem in France, uh, much more than uh, 250 people. It's incredible the number of, of projects, uh, in particular in finance, but not only. So, for example, data sharing and, of course, the use case diploma I am in, I, I presented at that, uh, at that stage. And uh, finally, uh, the last uh, but not least was called notarization, and it's now called traceability registry. And there I also had the idea, thanks to our Dutch colleague, or to one Dutch colleague, to work on the apostille which is a subject for millions of people every year in the world, <laughs> the transformation of a legal international private law procedure. So these are, those webinars have contributed to really um, uh, create a community of people who want to do things together. And uh, people came to me saying that we should work together. So I decided to, work, to, to write a white paper called the blockchain technology for the public sector. And now I am sharing this in the chat. And uh, it is in French, but it's already translated into English and German. And I, I hope um, you will be um, uh, interested to see how pedagogical it is. And we are showing several cases that are already uh, currently being done within a uh, French public administration. Uh, to, to just end up, uh, yes, this year we decided to, to have this initiative with all those stakeholders. And uh, we began last February to hear from Alastria. And then in June, I, I proposed uh, the Dutch uh, Blockchain Coalition to uh, all those French uh, stakeholders and uh, also. Um, then we had the German ID Union. I wanted to have you, Nena, present uh, the Slovenian initiative, but of course it was already very stressful for you, as uh, Slovenia is now um, heading uh, the, the European uh, Council. And um, and so finally, I will. Uh, I am very happy to have this opportunity to hear from Italy from uh, Ireland and Luxembourg. Uh, and I, I hope um, to achieve what we have in, in mind uh, until the end of the year for the French presidency. And just one, one, word, one, word, one more word to say that we are currently working within my University of Lille to issue the, the verifiable credentials for all our students. So we have 80,000 students is the largest uh, uh, university by the number of students. And we will issue this month um, on cold data uh, 25,000 verifiable credentials that correspond to the diploma. We are very proud, of course, when you speak about verifiable credentials, you are also in self sovereign identity and in that tendency that is really interesting on uh, change the way we issue, we share, we storage our data. So that's it for the time being, but I can tell you it's really exciting. Blockchain is only 5%, but it's very important. And uh, the rest is digitization of our schooling departments. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Perrin. Uh, yeah, very interesting story, and I appreciate you focused into that diploma use case because uh, you are really uh, very advanced in this. Uh, so I think that we can cooperate also you know, within the EBP um, further steps for for uh, the next development. Uh, our last uh, no last lady speaker is um, Victoria, but I'm not sure if she's with us. Hello. Ah, you are here. Hello, Victoria. <laughs> um, I'm very happy to have you here uh, as uh, you have quite strong uh, ecosystem of our uh, EU blockchain convention. Um, and um, please.
Tell us about uh, your experiences, um, how you deal with the organizing uh, blockchain week, uh, what were the, were the main findings, uh, and uh, what are the main conclusions maybe from uh, these uh, different discussions that you have with, uh, within uh, blockchain week? Please. Thank you very much, Nina, and thank you very much for the invitation and congratulations on, on this event. Uh, sorry for my voice. Um, I've been very sick the whole week weekend, just been in bed. I actually did a COVID test this weekend, but it was an antigen and that was negative. And I was told that I shouldn't trust those ones. But uh, I'm at home now, so I cannot, <laughs> I cannot pass this, whatever it is, to anyone else. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm Victoria Gago. I'm one of the co-founders of the European Blockchain Convention. We founded European Blockchain Convention, me and my partner, back in 2018, and have so far organized uh, five European um, events. Um, so we started in Barcelona in 2018, had 500 attendees. And in our fifth edition, where Nina was also participating, we had 2,000 attendees. That was in April, online, obviously. That's the only thing we can offer right now. From the very beginning, we've always been very focused on making sure that the community can network with uh, like-minded people and find whatever they're looking for. So that could be a new partner, an employee, investments, um, whatever they're looking for. So, yeah, and we've had very, very good feedback from day one, both from sponsors, participants, speakers, that they really, really enjoy our events, so we were happy. But one thing that they were then still asking for was education. Um, I would say that even through our conferences, we, we provide very high level content. So kind of even that is education, but it's, it's different, right? Because it's talks, it's discussions. So um, this year we launched European Tech School. I'll share a few links in a bit. Very exciting, um, very exciting. We have to sound our blockchain school. It's online, so that makes it possible for anyone in, around Europe, even outside Europe, to, to participate in our courses. We started last Tuesday with two programs, a five-week program, which we call the Blockchain Executive Course, and then we have a, a Blockchain Certified Expert Program, which is a 10-week program. So what we've tried to do here, it's something different from most programs out there. So like, I don't know, if you go and I don't know, like, I don't know, so Oxford University, MIT, so they all have uh, their blockchain courses, but they all pre-recorded. So it's pre-recorded education. Uh, what we are doing differently is that all classes are live. So the students can interact with the professor and interact with the students. At the end of the day, we want, we want them to build their community with the students, with the co-students and with the professors. Also, I think another very important and cool aspect of our courses is that all our professors are actually professionals working with blockchain technology on a daily basis. That's also, that adds, adds a lot of value to, to the students because it's not just someone that knows about blockchain, blockchain technologies, but it's actually someone that's uh, working with the technologies on a daily basis. It's very important as well. Um, at the end of the day, uh, we're very aware of this huge blockchain gap we have uh, in Europe and even outside Europe. So we want to make our courses as as hands-on and as, I mean, the idea is that they can, after doing our course, be able to, to incorporate their ideas or be incorporated in, in other organizations. Um, so yeah, very exciting. And I mean, some some lessons, I would say, I was from, 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 from our first edition back in 2018 to now, um, what we've seen is, I think, when you look at the startups in the ecosystem, the quality, uh, I mean, completely different quality. I mean, at, in the beginning, um, in the beginning, when well, the beginning for me was 2017, 2018, uh, the startups, uh, there were good startups, but there were a lot, a lot of like, not very interesting startups. And also, I think this was due to the whole ICO boom we were living in those days. So, um, yeah, a lot of startups realized they could raise quick money by doing an ICO, and and then then nothing came out of that. But what we're seeing now is like 
like really some interesting startups um, doing some really like, yeah, cool projects, having some really, really cool, cool um, uh, team members. And it's, I think it's also interesting to see how these startups are uh, recruiting um, professionals from, from some of the largest companies we all know. Uh, it's interesting, right? Because it's kind of getting really, really hot to be in the blockchain space. So amazing, but still there is a huge gap, a uh, talent gap. So, I mean, just to give you an idea, um, so if you go to Crunchbase and look up blockchain crypto startups, during the last 12 months, more than 1,000 startups have raised more funds and some of them have, have raised like some crazy amount of money. And obviously an important part of the, of the fund, uh, funding goes to hiring. So again, uh, yeah, we need more talent um, and we need it now. So again, that's why we also launched European Tech School. I also say another very interesting finding from our side, it's to see how uh, more corporates got into the space from at least from our first edition. Um, we did already have several uh, large corporates, uh, European corporates uh, participating in our first edition in 2018. But now most large corporates have a blockchain team, even if it's a one person blockchain team, and the ones that had a one person blockchain team a few years back have like teams already of five, 10, 15, 20 people, which is exciting to see that these teams are, are growing as well. Um, so uh, yeah, for us, we will continue, yeah, bringing together the community through the European Blockchain Convention. Our next edition is in December and try to yeah to add value where we can now with education we, we also see a gap when it comes to funding um but it also again depends a bit on the composition of the teams and advisors but we're not going to enter this space for now um we'll let other other players in the ecosystem um and what else um yeah i think yeah, for us now, it's yeah where we were adding values, connecting the ecosystem and, and providing education now through, through the European Tech School. Thank you very much, Victoria. Um, very interesting because you focused on uh, startups. It's obviously <clears throat> a rather wave after 2017. Uh, then corp um, the blockchain teams in uh, the corporates and the uh, the educational part, which is also very important. Um, thank you. I would like to uh, invite Mr. Tadej Slavnik, uh, the CEO of uh, Hashnet and also responsible for Adriatic region to, uh, to describe a little bit about uh, blockchain Adria and uh, what are you doing within that supporting environment. Uh, thank you, Nina. Yes, actually, Blockchain Adria is a regional network of uh, stakeholders, not just uh, companies on the field of uh, blockchain, but also conventional companies that we are trying to connect uh, in the region of, uh, let's say, southeastern Europe, uh, mostly Slovenia, uh, Croatia, Serbia, and uh, bordering countries. Um, through that uh, network, we actually organized uh, the conference in the start of this year. Uh, it was the main focus of the conference was uh, blockchain for enterprises, uh, uh, with the main aim, of course, to uh, not just gather the actors on the field of blockchain uh, uh, companies, but also to, to gather conventional companies that we see that they are not. Uh, they are not introduced so much with the concrete solutions, uh, concrete uh, uh, use cases that they could use uh, in their particular fields. Uh, that's why we focused uh, to, of course, on one hand, uh, invite uh, uh, from the region, but also on European scale, uh, really concrete uh, solutions on various fields of, uh, let's say, uh, economical verticals starting from energy to circular economy to finance to also uh, other uh, uh, part of use uh, um, uh, of the concrete solutions. And on the other side, we had more than 200 representatives of comp companies uh, in the region who are now, uh, let's say, uh, uh, 
trying to find out how they could utilize this, uh, this technology in their concrete businesses. Um, we also focused to introduce into the region uh, the development of uh, EBSI, European Blockchain Service Infrastructure. Here we also see that it's really important to, uh, to introduce all the activities that are being uh, uh, already, uh, already developed on European level, also on the level of member states. And the uh, third focus of the Blockchain Adria conference was uh, the introducing the national blockchain infrastructures. Uh, as you, Nina, uh, are familiar, uh, in Slovenia, uh, our company together with uh, uh, Telemach and the Ministry of Economic Development uh, launched the pilot version of uh, national blockchain infrastructure C-Chain in 2019. And through these activities, we find out uh, that uh, of course, on one hand, a lot of interest among the, uh, among the companies is to find out how they can use the infrastructure, which use cases can be integrated, but also we find out that uh, many other uh, European member states are developing uh, their own national blockchain infrastructure. That's why we dedicated uh, a part of the conference also to discuss the potential cross-border collaboration. Uh, we had uh, uh, colleagues from I Italy, uh, from their national uh, initiative, uh, IPSI, and from Spain, Alastria, that we discussed how, of course, we as a member states and actors on national level could, uh, could, uh, co could collaborate uh, uh, in order to connect uh, the initiative, to uh, focus on interoperability issues among uh, these national networks on one side, and on the other side, of course, how to include the national infrastructure in uh, European blockchain service inf infrastructure. Uh, second uh, important conference that we organized together uh, with our colleagues from uh, Croatia, uh, uh, their uh, national institute, uh, Ruger Boskovic, and uh, uh, partners uh, in, uh, on their national level, it was the conference uh, with the focus blockchain for circular economy. Uh, where again we, are, we were trying to, like Tom mentioned uh, uh, already, to, to see what concretely we already have, uh, which concrete solutions uh, we could introduce to the conventional companies that they can be used for uh, various uh, uh, solutions on the field of circular economy on one side, and on the other side we, uh, we transferred the, the lessons learned from Slovenia, building up our national blockchain infrastructure to Croatia, and uh, uh, important, uh, let's say, uh, result of this, uh, that conference in May was uh, initiating the national initiative uh, uh, to building the blockchain, uh, national blockchain infrastructure uh, crops in, uh, in uh, Croatia. Uh, uh, last activity that actually uh, resulted also uh, uh, today with the European Blockchain Week was the preparation, uh, preparation of the, uh, this important ev event that uh, uh, also uh, it was a lot, a lot of support and engagement of the uh, Slovenian uh, uh, blockchain for data uh, trusted ecosystem digital innovation hub that it was um, that it was formed uh, this year in Slovenia at, uh, Technology Park Ljubljana uh, faculty of uh, computer science and hashnet company established this digital innovation hub uh, in the start of this year actually that uh, uh, we we um, put a lot of effort also that in the framework of the presidency of Republic of Slovenia uh, 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 to the European, uh, uh, European Union Council that we, uh, together with many partners, uh, prepare the European Blockchain Week, of course, with the main aim to connect uh, all the main actors uh, in the region with the, uh, um, uh, a lot of uh, uh, wonderful project and wonderful partners on European scale uh, to let's say, uh, find the answers how we can utilize blockchain and AI technology to, uh, to achieve the main goals of transition uh, and Green Deal on European level. Thank you very much, Shadeh. <coughs> um, yeah, we've heard a lot of speakers today, and each of you
stages of uh, or pillars of um, um, engagement through uh, exact use case of ISHIA, we heard, um, and um, educational part from Chase to um, use case on diplomas, uh, and then findings what startups have done have uh, done in this. Uh, period uh, and what would be uh, the future solution for blockchain to blockchain infrastructures and uh, strengthening the environment um, also here for for uh, the ecosystem now I have one question for all of you um, and maybe just to think as there we have a lot of different things <laughs> Um, and my challenge is how to connect all these different things together, how to put them on the common, de the common denominator. So at least each of you um, uh, think about three things or three steps, how can we connect all the things together that we heard today uh, into one uh, reasonable approach to put all blockchain community together. Maybe uh, we will not start at the same, um, uh, <clears throat> um, f uh, but uh, Perin and then uh, uh, Parisa and then maybe uh, Victoria and uh, then um, we here um, after Laura and Raffaello. Right. Perin? Right. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, when we speak about blockchain and education, people don't get it. So I will very shortly explain how we'll all join together on that subject. Um, the, the global idea is that there is not, as of today, there is not uh, a way to find at any stage in your life uh, a diploma or a competence that you acquired at work uh, during... Uh, uh, work experience or later in life, you know, if you have worked uh, 12 years at IBM, for example, you've got a badge, an open badge. And the, the global idea is that within 10 years, it will be easy at any stage in your life to find anything that relates to human, human resources, <laughs> not finance, <laughs> but human resources. And we'll all have a uh, a crypto wallet like Ledger, a French company is uh, offering uh, one or selling one. We'll have that like uh, it, it would be uh, our wallet where you put sometimes a diploma or an open badge or your social security card or your money, of course, because wallet is about money. And we'll have that in the pocket. And when we we'll share it, it's like today, like paper. Not everyone, and in particular the government, will be able to track it. Now it will be will be at the center of this digitization, and this is where we all come together on these international standards. Uh, and and I think it, it we we are all working together to go to that objective one day. This is my vision. Thank, Thank you, you Perrin. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Parisa, what do you think? Uh, I would like to um, take the three points of view. You know, the, there are three points of view actually in the society the, from the user's point of view, from the decision makers that can be from companies or about the government, uh, governmental decision makers, and also the, the computer scientists. The problem today is that we have an explosion of information about everything and uh, we cannot find the matching, you know, and the corresponding about our needs with the correct uh, uh, technology that we want to use. So it is, in my opinion, it's very important that we can arrive to find a way uh, as we want to do on the chase, I wish, 
that uh, to match uh, these three uh, points of view, because actually the users, for example, they don't know the vocabulary about the event, the vocabulary about the blockchain. And the decision makers, they don't know if they should go or not to go to, to, uh, to using of the blockchains. What are the advantages? What are the inconvenience? So the, the problem is finding the information and also finding the matching between the stakeholders between the different decision makers and also the computer scientists and the technology. So I think that's a real big challenge that we have. And as we want that uh, in the Europe, uh, we have this challenge. We want to, we are well placed to acquire, I said, global leadership. But uh, if we cannot arrive to find this matching, we cannot, uh, you know, impose uh, our points of view also on the world. So maybe the originality will be in this uh, point of view. Thank you. And this is why we have such projects like yours uh, and uh, to serve to, 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 the, to that matching that you propose. Uh, Victoria, what are your thoughts here? <laughs> Yes. So I will also divide it into three three points. Actually, I'll start with the security. Now that uh, Perrine mentioned Ledger, a uh, huge issue with Ledger last year. Um, so yeah, so when it comes to the whole blockchain space, we still lack um, security standards in many projects, right? So just to give you an idea, last year, Ledger was hacked, so um, a list of one million email addresses um, were shared on the internet from, from Ledger, and then another list of um, email addresses, addresses and names as well was, uh, was uh, hacked from Ledger. So this is a huge issue. I mean, myself, I was on this list of one million email addresses. At least my address did not appear because I was on that list. But yeah, we have some huge problems when it comes to security uh, and we need some standards there. It's quite, you know, uncomfortable, scary <laughs> to find yourself on a list like that. So this is a very important aspect uh, for many projects and we need yeah, some standards. So obviously when it comes to standards, they, they, they appear much slower, right? And the, and the industry evolves, which is also good. But yeah, this is a very important aspect. Then another very important aspect is regulation. Obviously, it comes also later on, so the, the technology can evolve, evolve, and then the regulation comes. Um, I'm actually very much looking forward to, to, to Mika, hopefully being introduced uh, in a year, year time, more or less. Um, I'm looking forward, but I'm also a bit scared because at the end of the day, obviously, we want, we want, to, we want to protect consumers, companies, and so on, on one side, but we also, on the other side, we don't want to stop innovation. So, so how, how do you regulate the use of technologies when, 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 when things are changing constantly, right? So whatever was, what, what was relevant, I mean, we can see it when our, with our, uh, our programs and agendas of the conference, things change so quickly, right? So we need to adapt. And also on the other side, I mean, this is also what we are doing with our courses, trying to be covering what's the latest. Um, I'm actually also the director of a master degree taught in Spanish um, by Three Points OBS Business School, collaborating with the, the Polytechnic University of Catalonia. And here, for example, since we're collaborating with the official university, I need to do changes in the program like in, in a year in advance. And I'm like, yeah, I know this is the procedure <laughs> with a traditional university, but like we talk about technologies that are advancing so fast. So this is a, this is a problem. Um, but yeah, going back to regulation, I'm, I'm looking very much forward to Mika, but also, I don't know, maybe a bit scared. Let's see how, how it goes and how this can be adapted. And then I also think another very important aspect at the end of the day, um, I do still think, I think it was mentioned before, we need, I mean, we have a lot of uh, senior professionals, decision makers still 
not very much into technologies, right? And that, that's definitely a problem that this can be both from private companies or public institutions, right? And it makes sense. I mean, if you're going to get, um, uh, how, does it, how do you say, get on, when you stop working, you become, you become retired. That's the word, retired. So when you retire, obviously, I mean, if you're going to get retired in, I don't know, five years, maybe, <laughs> why should you care about technologies, right? But this is a problem. So another very important aspect, I think, when it comes to public and private institutions is to get more evangelists within their own organizations to kind of like educate within the organizations and convince, take that risk. <laughs> Obviously, if you're too provocative with something new, there is a risk of you getting, being fired. Hopefully not, but like, yeah, I mean, the, these roles of evangelists are very, very important, both in private and public institutions to convince um, decision makers to, to get involved in the space. So yeah, so uh, security regulation and evangelists. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, we are facing the same issue, you know, uh, how to <laughs> convince them, um, uh, for example, public institutions to, to um, <clears throat> integrate those technologies into the working systems. But uh, I think that uh, here in Slovenia we are on a quite good way because uh, a lot of the ministries decided to uh, embrace uh, the advanced technologies and integrate it to the um, uh, that administrative systems because they are simplifying the procedures and uh, this is what we want to achieve uh, in the longer term. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Laura and Rafael, are you still with us? Yes. Yes, yes of course. Perfect. No, I, I be, sh be short, please. <laughs> can you see us? Uh, can you see us, Nana? Nana? Perfectly. Okay. okay. So, I, I, yeah, as speaking with Laura, I think if she can agree that everything that we've heard uh, up to now is exactly what we're experiencing. But uh, in Italy, we've, uh, in, in the past three years, we've, uh, we've lectured at... Uh, the major universities here, and we've um, we've spoken with uh, um, students and also uh, bachelor degrees and uh, masters, and also companies through the universities. So there is interest. Uh, the problem is that uh, me as a soft uh, as a software engineer, I always find difficulty to make institutions and universities understand that our uh, generation is not only of geeks. I mean, everything does come from us typing on the keyboard and being by ourselves. But, you know, every component today of our life is filled with software. And when you speak with a lawyer, I mean, my wife is a lawyer, she's my wife. Um, they, they all, we all take her seriously, right? And she, this is, it's institutionalized. It's a degree, it's, you have a uh, certification, you know? And I'm trying to do that same thing for software engineers because it isn't at the same level. Not yet, it seems as though it is, but it isn't really. And I think that uh, from the school part, uh, making this something that students should look up to, it, not just as a hobby, but becoming an actual a standard. Not, not something that has to be regulated, but something that has to be, uh, you know, understood that, it, that the new uh, way of life is also, uh, you know, software uh, based. It's not just something that a, a young guy just comes up with in a, in a garage. I know that this seems, ah, it's not like that. What are you saying? No, this is why we're having the problems because we need to have people, as you were saying before, uh, Parisa and Victoria and Perrin, uh, you were saying that institutions and head of companies do not still understand or they don't trust you know, the whole process. Surely we're not explaining correctly, but the problem is this, we need to have 
lawyers and software engineers and you know CEOs collaborate together. The companies uh, need to look at software engineers not only as their uh, workers that are doing just web pages or whatever, you know, they need to look at the people that are making the software, the open, uh, the open software, uh, software that's being published, uh, and that we're all using every day. It's just that they don't still don't realize that. So uh, that's what I've been speaking about. That's why I'm speaking about this. And Laura asked me to, to speak about this. I've been doing this to universities. And most of them look at me weirdly, but others understand. And I need a couple of people out of 100 to understand this, because they will be the ones that in the future will start to negotiate and start talking with us. We don't speak a different language. It's just that we write the software in a different language, but we don't speak another language. We're making it for the community. And this is what I'm trying to understand. And Laura is great at this because she's a great speaker and she's the one certifying that we're doing everything for mankind. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Laura and Raffaello. Uh, I think that uh, you pointed out a very interesting thing. Um, besides of institutional and knowledge gap, we have a generational gap, so we need to overcome definitely uh, this gap. And um, uh, at the end, uh, we hope that also that traditional sector of uh, population will uh, be able to understand and embrace the technology like it is. Uh, thank you very much. I would pass the word to um, uh, Tom, maybe uh, your three points. <laughs> Yes, uh, thank you. Difficult question. Unfortunately, I have forgotten my magic wand uh, at home, so uh, I cannot come up with the magic uh, solution. But I think, indeed, uh, there's a lot of things that have been said. I, I can agree. I think, number one point, uh, I would say, is education also, as has been said now, and education really on a broad level. I don't mean necessarily technical education. I would say that's probably even the most easiest one, forget me for that one, but I think that you can learn via the books. But what I mean with education is also, for instance, on sea level, uh, really to make sure that on sea level, really the whole impact of blockchain is well understood uh, because um, it's an evolution. Once it started, it will be very quick and a lot of um, sectors will be disrupted and will be surprised. So. Um, that's really something where we are emphasizing quite a lot. Um, it needs a change of mind also. It has been said it's a collaboration between a lot of different people, be it uh, lawyers and software engineers, um, but uh, also accountants uh, and also between different industries. Um, and that's something also where you have actually um, something very new is that by um, collaborating with your competitor, you actually manage to um, bring value to your own company. Um, you have to just, well, take one step back and, and accept that. And that is something very hard, of course, um, and to accept. And that's really, for me, all part of, of education. So you might call it informing education, training at, at different levels. But that's uh, really, uh, I would say, a quintessential. It's um, j j just one word maybe also um, about the user. My own perspective is that the, the end user might not be the most interesting, important person in the sense that the end user does not necessarily care what the technology behind is. The end user wants to know, um, you know, is it secure? Can I trust it? Um, we all use applications every day and we don't know exactly what the technology behind is. We read reviews, so we trust those people and those organizations that we trust that they did the job for us and um, they um, well they checked whether it is secure so that's our own education that that we do then um, so of course we mustn't forget the end user but i don't think that's the first uh, point uh, point to address so education would be the first one second one definitely um, working yeah, on interoperability standards um, if you want to launch a project today in blockchain you have such a vast choice of different blockchains, the hundreds, uh, so which one would you take? There are a few ones that are more used than others. Of course, uh, you would uh, first have a look at, at those, but even there you have different flavors, you know, going in different directions. So it's very complex. And that's something 
Um, of course, you can't impose winners, so uh, the market will solve it, but you can work on interoperability and on standards so that you know it converges in some, some directions where at least there is possibility um, to, so that your solution which was developed on, on one technical solution might actually talk to, to another solution. And uh, the second one, definitely I would say yes, it's the legal framework. I know that we're in a sector where um, regula regulation is not always very um, welcomed, uh, but that's what provides um, legal certainty and that's what provides at sea level also um, reassures, of course, to go into a, a certain direction. So um, I think there have been uh, also um, already, I think, one or two years ago at EU level also there was a, a, a study, you know, what, what should be done uh, to go ahead and sandboxing was one of the outcomes, uh, for instance, that was mentioned. So these are the kind of um, initiatives that I think would, uh, would definitely um, help because if you are investing in a solution and you're not even sure whether the money you invest, you know, whether tomorrow maybe it will be said, well, sorry, that project, it's, um, it's nice, it's working, but it's completely uh, illegal or not uh, in line with anything else. So. Not, not a good uh, starting point to have a discussion with, with your, with your um, hierarchy, I would say. Um, so these are my three points, basically. <laughs> Thank you very much. So legal certainty, <laughs> it seems like a very European solution for everything that we want to have. Everything should be regulated, uh, legally certain, and what is the challenge then for sandboxes, for piloting, for... Uh, this is what I um, really want to um, uh, maybe point out. How can we deal with this? Not only uh, to have the final solutions, because the legal certainty means final solution that can be um, fixed, <laughs> but uh, uh, only the, the other way to, to the innovative approach. Legal certainty can also be um, very broad, actually. <laughs> so you don't have to be very specific. Uh, I mean, just to give you one example, uh, in Luxembourg there was um, two years ago the initiative to actually allow for the transfer of securities uh, on the blockchain. And all it took more or less was adding, you know, just the mention of DLTs in the law, in an existing law. So it was not a whole new framework was that was installed um, because, well, regulation basically is technology neutral. Yeah. Um, so basically it's just sure that, you know, DLT is also recognized without going, you know, any deeper into it because the principles that apply to that technology apply to, to any technology. Um, so I, I don't think it has to go necessarily deeper. Thank you, Tom. Fiona, what do you think? <laughs> oh, I think these are all some very good ideas and very reflective. I'm sort of heartened that I, I see so much reflected in our own work in Blockchain Ireland. For example, we were active participants in the Chase project. Um, we were... Uh, we're very interested to see what University of Lille is doing, you know, modeling the EPSI use cases and taking that quite um, uh, Europe-led approach is, is very interesting. Um, I have two things to bear in mind, which I, I certainly that's what helps us in Blockchain Ireland. We identify ourselves as a, we don't say we're a community of practice, but we operate that way. We have working groups, and there's the legal working group working on smart legal contracts, and we'll publish a sort of nationally relevant paper later this year. We have an enterprise working group that is looking at, um, I guess, educating the C-suite kind of uh, side of things. Uh, we have an education and innovation and skills development working group, which uh, is, is what connected with the Chase project uh, and is, con I, I would say they're very, uh, my colleague Joyce O'Connor leads that. She's very concerned with uh, policy progression and connecting with Europe. Uh, and I would say, uh, and I'm the chair of the startups group, and uh, I'm very much, um, I have a startup myself. I'm only one member of the group. I don't like push my own company, but I see us being led by a community of early adopters, and we very much rely on that community to champion the cause. Uh, yeah, any like any startup, you can make mistakes and you can fail, 
but we learn from failure. Um, nobody is successful out of the, you know, straight away. Uh, and we embrace that and we share that knowledge together. Uh, it's not useful for us in a small country like Ireland to see our ecosystem as our immediate competitors. We have to see ourselves as enabling each other in the ecosystem and in that community. Um, so yeah, community of participation, um, and I see us all here as part of that as well. We're reflecting that move, that push towards digital transformation in Europe. Uh, and then this comes from my work, um, my own work with my company, but also I do quite a lot of standardization work for ISO and SEN. And look, where I'm currently um, co-editor of a technical report with a colleague, Wenting, from uh, Ant Chain in China. So we're collaborating from that very e-commerce perspective and that real, you know, uh, stack-based approach of um, blockchain and how that's becoming accessible to um, massive markets through the kind of outsourcing type business model and seeing how that can be reflected with a more European style, cross-border yeah. worries, regulation driven, and we see what's happening in China now, they're moving more towards a data regulation stance. Um, so we have a lot to learn and share from each other. And what we're doing together is modeling a new um, data flow analysis, which enables both a business side view into blockchain systems and blockchain use cases, as well as a technical um, uh, component side view and modeling both uh, how the, you know, relating to the stakeholders, what sort of data is moving through the system and where and how, and being able to flag up in your territory or in your business model, are you trading with Europe? What does that mean in terms of GDPR? What does that mean in terms of very important information, as they might call it, in other territories, and how you can flag that up. So we are communities of participation. We're in the very blockchain and DLT world. We're co-creating multi-party systems. And as early adopters or as the practitioners at this early phase, we must remember that that's what we are doing with our ecosystems. And we are constantly onboarding a C-suite type I don't like the whole ageist thing because actually there's some amazing early adopters at that level. Um, but when we see somebody ready to make, take a new stance 18 months later, it's because they have had a chance to learn and to practice from ecosystems. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Today, uh, please, what is your opinion? Three points. Be short, please, okay. because we are approaching uh, to the end of the first day. one. Like yeah. all the previous speakers pointed out, cross-sectoral cross collaboration uh, to find the answers uh, uh, on the field of uh, education, on the field of adoption, on the field of research. Of course, it's impossible that uh, you have in one organization all this knowledge. That's why cross-sectoral collaboration number one. Second, uh, being aware about the adoption issues. Uh, I agree, Tom, with you that uh, uh, end users uh, shouldn't uh, take care uh, about what concrete solution is behind, but if the, if the using, ex uh, using experience and uh, adoption barrier is too high, and if the developers and uh, let's say technology uh, te uh, technology engineers uh, will not be aware of that, will be facing this also. Uh, and uh, third, uh, uh, let's say also proposal or, or the lessons learned from Slovenia, from the concrete activities, uh, what we did is uh, doing concrete steps uh, and. Uh, introducing uh, concrete, uh, concrete uh, let's say, also first uh, possibilities to engage in, for example, testing the national infrastructure, uh, opening the wallet, uh, integrating the first, uh, the first use case, uh, 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 introducing the user experience of the concrete use case, and getting these uh, uh, questions to be answered when you start to do that. Uh, of course, uh, this is quite complex, but uh, 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 I, I see the only way if we would like to achieve this final goal of massive adoption, of course, we have to 
uh, on the one uh, uh, step stop uh, speaking about uh, this general uh, regulation issue barriers and start to uh, implement uh, and start to uh, pilot. That's why uh, EPSI piloting program is 100% uh, the way to go, but uh, I would definitely, uh, of course, um, suggest that such activities should be also uh, realized on national level and also uh, on the uh, international uh, level, uh, like now we are discussing to also share the knowledge, to share the uh, not just good practices, but bad practices, lessons learned, uh, and of course to uh, build a kind of distributed collaboration uh, on the end, uh, because it's needed if we would like to develop a distributed uh, technology ecosystem. Very nice thought for the, <laughs> for the end. Thank you very much today. Uh, I completely agree. So distributed knowledge and distributed system. Uh, I think that um, you just uh, made a step forward to our work because I wanted to su suggest follow-up for this panel that we have and we connect all the um, points or all the issues that were pointed out today uh, and to form a kind of um, user guide to blockchain ecosystems in the future. Uh, this is, would, would be also the task for EBP because I will uh, suggest to EBP to go in this way uh, and uh, in December when we meet again, organize again this, um, uh, that kind of panel and see how we compose together all distributed approach to distributed technology. Thank you very much for today and have a nice evening. Bye bye. Thank you, Nena. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, this is the closure of uh, today's um, first blockchain day of the week. Uh, I invite you tomorrow to join us uh, at 10 o'clock when we start with uh, high level speeches and then with the panels on um, blockchain and AI for uh, EU Green Deal according to the program. Thank you very much and goodbye.